Everybody knows your brand new car is your second largest investment in your lifetime, only second to your house. So you want to know that every time you turn that key and you drive off, you're slowly ruining your vehicle. Now there's things that you can do that will accelerate that and there's things that you can do to protect and stop destroying your car. Well, I'm going to share a list of five of those key tactics to help you prevent the natural destruction of your vehicle and make sure it lasts forever. Let's get into it now. Life's too short to drive boring cars. So the first tactic is really all about maintenance. Everybody talks about maintenance. Yes, where do you start? Where do you end? There's so many complicated conversations. But what we have right here is the owner's manual for this brand new BMW X2 that's parked right behind me. In this manual, you're going to find all the details about how to operate all of the technology within the vehicle, but you're also going to see the advice on maintenance practices. Now, a lot of these modern day vehicles here come pre-programmed with the maintenance schedules plugged into the electronics. So after, say, 8,000 kilometers, all of a sudden, lo and behold, you'll get a little alarm light that'll tell you service due, whether it's free oil, whether it's for your brake fluid, whatever it is, you'll often get notified with a lot of these modern day vehicles. Not every vehicle though with that said. And so you wanna make sure that you're doing more than your minimum share of basic maintenance. I wanna talk about some of those maintenance items that are so important. Now being that this is a BMW specifically, but this applies to virtually every vehicle, oil and filter changes are so important for these vehicles. Pop the hood. Right there, we've got engine oil. That's where you fill it up. And there's no dipstick in this car. Because a lot of modern day vehicles, like a lot of luxury vehicles, actually use electronic dipsticks. There's no longer a place to check via the old school. A lot of the older vehicles, or even some of the more base model vehicles, still have that opportunity to pull the dipsticks. You can smell it, look, listen, touch, and then you get the warm and fuzzy. A lot of these vehicles, you can't even check the condition of the oil without dumping it from the bottom. But either way, continually check the level of your oil and of course make sure you stay on top of your oil services how do we know what those are every manufacturer has a little bit different directions regardless many of them share the same grade of oil but the different manufacturers actually have different provisions some cars are run a little hotter turbocharging supercharging they'll break down the oil a little sooner if they're a naturally aspirated honda for example or a toyota they may not eat the oil as aggressively they may not get as hot and maybe the intervals aren't quite so tight but personally any vehicle like we're looking at here is a two liter turbo engine it's called the b48 in the bmw world definitely is going to have a higher demand on the oil so you're definitely going to want to change the oil more frequently and my personal recommendation is keep it under eight to ten thousand miles regardless of the extended intervals that a lot of these manufacturers have been offering up because oil is relatively cheap and a new engine isn't but how do you know what kind of oil well other than the owner's manual you can also check Right here in the BMW, you'll notice it says right there, 0W20. Another piece of maintenance that's super critical with a lot of modern day vehicles as they run really hot. And there's a lot more extensive use of plastics under the hood. For example, BMW's well known for that. A lot of BMWs of five to 10 years ago had a lot of problems with coolant leaks because of a lot of plastic fittings would start to crack and split because of the heat cycles, hot, cold, hot, cold, then split and leak. Then you got $150, $200 hose to replace and it's always buried deep in the engine. I mean, look in here, you can barely even see a coolant hose. Everything's buried under these plastics, under this other plastic work or frame. It's very difficult, but you'll notice right there, you've got more plastic fittings on this coolant reservoir. That's an indication that if you don't take care of your coolant, it won't take care of you. So if you have any leaks developing, fix it right away because sometimes that can lead to further problems. If you wind up sustaining a leak and you get a low level and you're not continually checking your coolant levels, you could actually potentially, worst case, overheat your engine. These engines like this that are aluminum block, aluminum heads, you overheat them once, the engines almost throw away. Sometimes there isn't even enough tolerance to be able to remachine them and get them down to factory specifications. In other words, stay on top of your maintenance. Don't neglect the coolant. Leaks, fix them. I would even suggest changing your coolant regularly. A lot of manufacturers are now saying, oh, it's regular lifetime use coolant. No need, nonsense. Change it anyway. There's nothing like having fresh lifeblood flowing through those veins in your vehicle definitely always something we're doing and of course specifically one of the service elements that they always talk about as well are brake fluids not just when your brakes wear out and not just changing the pads that you'll find behind that caliper or even your disc right there the thickness you also should continually change your brake fluid and where is that located just in front of the driver compartment here usually is where your brake master cylinder is. Sometimes you have to remove some plastic to get access to it, but make sure you change that fluid regularly. It's very important. With a lot of aggressive stop and go cycles, 
heating, cooking, heating, cooking, especially if you're driving through mountains and up and down a lot of hills, that brake fluid can start to break down and develop water pockets. Well, water doesn't compress like brake fluid. And as a result, A, you'll lose brake capacity and B, you'll start to develop corrosion and exacerbate even further issues within your braking. So definitely don't neglect brake fluid, change the fluid semi-regularly and just follow the owner's manual on that particular piece. Another piece of maintenance you want to consider, you'll notice right there, that's a battery connection. Yeah, you can have a battery, whether it's sometimes under the hood or sometimes the batteries are even in the back of the vehicle and this is just a connection port whatever the circumstance sometimes if you're leaving your vehicle for an extended period of time do not leave it uncharged you may go away say for example to a holiday somewhere or maybe you're just busing it for two weeks three weeks to work and you don't necessarily need to use your vehicle for an extended period of time i strongly suggest putting on a trickle charger without it you risk the battery getting weak that then can cause other problems low va battery voltage can cause problems of electronics start to fail malfunction it can sometimes the thresholds aren't met on electronic boards and circuitry which let's face it all these vehicles nowadays are very complex and rely on that very tight tolerances so make sure you always keep your battery tender on if you're walking away from your vehicle for more than a week or two otherwise you can definitely find issues keep them charged right there's another critical piece you'll notice in this particular plastic housing right there there's a filter, right? That's engine air filter that goes into the intake manifold and that supplies the air mixed with fuel to create the combustion and makes your vehicle drive down the road. Do not neglect your air filter. I've actually seen many cases, Porsche 911s, for example, that people neglected the air filters just because maybe they don't drive them that often then they forget about them. And then they wind up dusting the engine. I know a lot of diesel engines. I had a 7.3 liter Ford diesel engine power stroke. And also I was told that it was starting to dust the engine. If you dust the engine, you wind up starting to introduce contaminants into the, in, into the combustion chamber, which can result in scoring damage and potentially just a ruined engine altogether. Do not neglect the air filter going into your vehicle. Also with that said, there's other filters, fuel filters, important. As well, there's another filter that's often buried underneath the firewall here that's really to address a lot of the breathing air within the cabin never hurts to get that updated as well change that out once in a while you don't want to breathe in dirty air that's good for the driver too right to have fresh air so the second tactic that you really have to be concerned with is you get the keys to your brand new car like this and then you're ready to drive it away and you think wow now i got a fine shiny new paint job how am i going to protect this vehicle from all the rough elements I mean, look, you've got gravel like this. You've got dirt and gravel and rocks all over the road. And then sometimes you live in states or provinces or even countries, Eastern Bloc and Europe, where they actually maybe use salt or sand on the roads. And you know you're going to subject your beautiful new shiny car to some really harsh conditions. Well, you want to make sure for the sake of your own sanity, you keep your car looking great. You want to maximize your profits for when you resell it. There's some things you need to do to the cosmetics of these vehicles. I would personally never drive this vehicle away off the car lot without doing the following. Right here, you want to make sure you put paint protection film on the front fender, on the hood, even on the headlights if you can, because now they're LEDs, they don't develop a lot of heat, so they won't melt the plastic film. I would put it there, I would also put it on the front bumper as well as the lower section. Down on the side, I would also definitely put paint protection film on the rocker panels because rocks can kick up and hit these panels, both off the front wheel, hitting the panels, or off the back wheels, it can splatter down here. Very important to even get these lips right in here. I always like to cover the paint protection film and wrap it around the corners like that. And if you can, depending on the vehicle, sometimes they have flared haunches right here, and you might even want to put a section of paint protection film right there. Down on the back, as you can see, you get a lot of splatter mark right there. Well, clearly that's a sign that if mud's coming there, rocks are gonna go there too. And I'd strongly advise that you put paint protection film on these back sections as well. Very, very important. You can also put paint protection film on here because as you haul luggage in and out of the trunk, it may start to scratch this area. Over here too, you may consider this. Sometimes you know when you're hanging this off, dropping this down, that's starting to scratch the paint right there, right? Never hurts to consider this area, as well as the pockets right here of the door handles, both back and the front, because as you reach in there, your fingers can actually scratch that area and cause a little further damage cosmetically. Can't forget the mirrors, as well as the A-pillars there should also be covered with paint protection film. Another section up here, 
Some people like to run a four or six inch strip across here too, because often a lot of rocks and take this out. Now glass, I wouldn't worry too much about most vehicles. You can change a windshield for two, $300. It's not really worth putting that protection film on there. That's a different product altogether, like Clearplex, but inside is important too. Personally, I don't like the factory mats. They look great, but they wear like crap. I mean, look what's going on down here already. Your heels start digging in. And quite frankly, I would actually opt for a set of real all-weather type mats that will curl up and catch water. You can get mats that kind of wrap around all the way, and they're made to catch water and gravel. And then once you all have all that collection of crap, you pull the mat out, you dump it on the ground, and then you put it back in there, and you're good to go. So personally, I would put all-weather mats on the inside, and make sure you stay on top of your leather conditioning. If you have leather steering wheel, leather seats, I would always make sure that you continue to take care of the leather, particularly on the bolstered areas like this, high touch areas on the steering wheel, as well as handles if you've got leather on the handles or any high touch contact points. And the third thing actually has to do with, with okay, you've got your great vehicle and it's wonderful and all new, but it's abusing it. Yes, abuse and use are two different things. It's one thing to use it every day. That's why you buy a vehicle. But then it takes it to the other side of the spectrum where you start to abuse it. For example, things like slamming doors or parking in that greasy, busy Walmart parking lot too tight to all the other junky cars. And then what you can result in is door dings. And nobody likes to see door dings. They're obscene, they're ugly, and quite frankly, makes it harder to sell a car when they're full of all kinds of dings all over the place. That to me is abuse. Take care of the car where you're parking it and it'll take care of you. Come winter time as well, using the snow brush on the windshield is fine. But then I see people all the time using brushes on the paint or even, you know, taking the, the brush in the car wash and taking it to the wheels and scuffing the crap out of the wheels. To me, that's abusive behavior and you're going to wreck the overall looks and cosmetics of the car overall. And more abuse comes in other formats and I'm sure you've seen this where somebody driving a small little SUV like this or even a minivan and all of a sudden you see a trailer hitch on the back of these vehicles and somebody goes and mounts a little hitch back there to haul a little trailer around. Then you see this little SUV on its ass. You see it dragging its ass along the road because it doesn't have enough capacity and it's not really meant to haul any real weight. But you see people towing trailers, whether it's boats or small trailers or tent trailers, and they're working the legs off this vehicle. And you gotta remember, a lot of these vehicles are based on front wheel drive platforms, transaxles, they're not all that strong and sturdy. The suspension is lightweight, the brakes are lightweight, and they're really not meant for towing. You wanna tow, you should have something, a bigger full-size SUV or a pickup truck, but a lot of people tow with a lot of vehicles. And to me, that's pure abuse. Suspension, brakes, everything just taking a toll. Not to mention you're working the engine two, three times harder than you normally would. That is abuse. If you need to tow something, either rent it something bigger or just buy something bigger. And so we've talked about abusing a car. Well, the next one is actually neglect. And that's number four. And that's something you really don't want to do. So there's overusing it. And then there's just neglecting it, not really caring. So for example, certain things, you want to make sure that you don't neglect your vehicle's paint. For example, if you have any rock chips or scratches, for example, like, like right here, we have a scratch there. You want to get that touched up as soon as possible. Right there, there's a rock chip right there. And you see more chips in there as well on the hood. Rock chips aren't just unsightly, but they can potentially as well start to corrode and result in rust. And nothing worse, even on a lighter car, for example, if you had a white or a silver car and you have rock chips, sure, you don't notice them as much, but once they start to rust, then you really start to see them and it looks really horrible. So don't neglect rock chips, scratches, marks. Make sure you touch them up as soon as possible to prevent any further contamination to the metal underneath. Neglect the paintwork and just the, let, the general cleanliness of the vehicle is a big problem as well. How many people have you seen drive their car out of the car wash and sure they say, hey, I wash my car all the time, but then you look underneath and you see the rocker panel down there and you see it dirty underneath. You actually can look and you could tell they didn't really care. They just wash the top end for quick looksies. But then underneath, you really got to get underneath to do a proper job of cleaning. For example, you got to go under the rocker panel here and give that a good clean underneath that lower section right there. It's nice to also clean these edges of your panels and fenders. 
I also like to clean the bottom edges of the doors, wipe the rubbers there too. And as well, I like to wipe in here. I always make sure that I give this a wipe in here with a rag and I actually fit in here as much as I can. I get all these spaces and keep cleaning these little areas that nobody ever bothers taking care of. Of course, the threshold section here as well, give that a good wiping and a polish. And again, more sections like this in the doorways, you wanna take care of that. Wipe those areas with a rag, keep it clean. Don't forget vacuuming the carpets. Very, very important. Do that regularly. Leather interior, definitely clean them up as well. That's neglect by not doing any of that work. So neglect in general just starts to make the car look ragged and tired and worn out with a few short years. That then transfers into your resale value. If you decide you want to sell a car in three years and you've been neglecting it all that time, it will show. You don't notice it, but somebody who's been shopping around for other versions of the same vehicle that people have actually been taken care of, it shows. If you have rock chips and door dings and the car's generally dirty and there's just an overall sense of lacking in maintenance, nobody wants that car. You got to take care of it and it will take care of you. And the next tactic to help you keep your car running forever and help stop destroying it is literally by controlling your particular driving style. Many cars are meant to go fast. Many cars are meant to be frugal. They all have different purposes, but the harder you drive them in short, the shorter they're going to wear. And of course it takes a toll on other than maintenance items as well. For example, if you're one of those people that likes to drive really hard around the corners, circle hard, crank the wheels, of course you're gonna start to see premature wear on the tires. You're gonna start to see wear on the outer edges of the tires. Definitely wanna control those moments when you wanna just really get on it. Also, if you're one of those people like to drive really, really hard and fast and on and off the gas all the time, A, you're gonna use a lot more fuel and B, that's going to work the engine harder. You're gonna move more oil, more cooling through the system. And of course that usually results in accelerated deterioration. If you're driving it hard constantly, you can expect additional wear on cam lobes and piston rings and cylinder walls. All those elements are gonna see more wear. Cars like this that are turbocharged are gonna be running hot all the time. Turbos, bearings, those are all going to wear prematurely. Of course your vehicle won't get the lifespan out of it. Sure, they're all meant to have some fun with, however, do that in selective moments. Gr aggressive driving may mean that you might even be topping up oil more frequently because you'll find your levels are a little bit lower. Cool it, you might have to change it more frequently. Oil changes more frequently as well. And the turbocharger that's buried down in there may need the actual replacement way before it's time. A lot of turbochargers are more or less rated to run the distance of the engine life, but that may not always be the case if you're driving it hard all the time. Again, there's those moments on the freeway you need to make a big passing move, just get in on it. That's great. But you also want to know that the vehicle can handle that. If you're driving it constantly hard all the time, it may start to get weaker. And then you may actually have a problem when you really need the power. Also, don't be that jerk Terry the tailgater. Because when you're tailgating somebody, you're risking both them, you're risking yourself. But also importantly, you're wearing out potentially the vehicle's brakes because you're on and off the brakes. If you're riding somebody really close, you're working, you're agitating those brakes. And what do you think that means? That means really accelerated brake brake wear, both on the brake disc as well as the pads that you find in the calipers. That's going to prematurely wear that out. And that's just gonna mean dollars out of your pocket. And speaking of braking, if you see you're coming up to a red light, ease into the brakes gradually. Then as you pull up and you're slowing right down here on the verge of stopping, then let it up slightly. So everything's smooth. Remember, driving smoothly both improves fuel economy reduces wear on your brakes, reduces wear on your engine, and everybody's a lot happier for it. Bottom line is, take care of the car and it will take care of you. And with all of this said, be sure to check out that video. You're gonna love it. How to make sure that you're not destroying your new engine. Hope to see each and every one of you on the next one. Catch you real soon. Bye-bye.